Ready? We can get started. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. We have a special AI seminar. Our speaker is Karen. Hi. Um, Karen has worked in AI, robotics, embedded systems, cognitive systems, lots of different areas in AI. And um, she's a very unique person in our community because she likes as much pure AI research as she likes diving into some real problem and uh, uh, finding ways to solve it. Um, Karen got hit her uh, PhD from Carnegie Mellon in 1997. Eight, 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 1998. And um, she was here at ISI maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And she gave a talk um, in, in that smaller uh, conference room that I'll never forget because she was talking about the real challenges of helping someone who's trying to live at home and has cognitive decline or other kinds of, um, you know, mixed abilities. Uh, that change over time. And that talk really changed my life in the way that I think about uh, the, the challenges that we have in deploying AI to support um, a lot of people. So Karen, without further ado, tell us about cognitive uh, electronic, electronic warfare. warfare. Well, thank you guys. I um, appreciate being here. It was great that we could figure out how to pull this together. Um, so cognitive electronic warfare, it's um, essentially the idea of how do we put artificial intelligence in radio systems, RF systems, radio frequency. And electronic warfare is one piece of RF systems where we get serious about what happens when the environment or an adversary is trying to make your life difficult. Um, so uh, Yolanda commented that I, you know, I have a PhD in, from Carnegie Mellon, so that was AI and robotics. I've been doing embedded AI ever since in lots of different domains. I have written three books, and most recently this uh, Cognitive EW one, which was targeted at the RF community and not at the AI community, because the RF community, particularly once you start talking more in the radar world, um, you are, it, it, the it, concepts of AI are really novel, foreign, you know, they know about cats and dogs on the internet, but that's kind of about it. So um, it, the idea was to say, okay, you've got this cool, hard problem, how, where and how can AI fit? So I give a talk, you know, probably three times a week um, and have been doing that for well over a year now. But this is the first time I'm giving this talk to a more AI community than an RF community. So it's gonna be a little unusual and I, I'm not quite sure how it's all gonna go. Um, so today, expect a little bit about EW, enough that you're understanding what the problem is, but much, much less about AI, because my assumption is that you know more about it than I do. Um, and then some ideas of where the AI community can come in and help solve the problems that we have in, in, in EW. Um, <clears throat> so just to check my own observations, there's only you know, a dozen of you so physically in the room, but how many of you feel like you can spell RF or spell EW? One, no oh, more. <laughs> a trick question. Oh, come on, it's not a trick question. No, I mean, in the sense of, you know, could you, when you talk about signal processing or, or you know, you know what the RF problems are? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I know there was, at least one of the people I spoke to this morning was there, but um, that's um, quite typical. I will often sit in a room of 400 people and everybody's an RF engineer and maybe two people have a meaningful relationship with AI. And this is exactly the opposite. So, so as my primer on EW, what is EW? Uh, so it's the concept of coordinated actions in the electromagnetic spectrum. So we all know about cameras in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but it goes all the way down from radio all the way up to the gamma, X-ray and gamma. So um, it's all information and energy that travels on the, uh, you know, in, in light waves. And um, so you've got radio, radio and radar, infrared and, and the electro-optical, which is the visible spectrum, um, and the ultraviolet. So for those of you who uh, like to use your microwaves to cook dinner, that's part of this. And if you're a beach goer, then you use the ultraviolet to cook yourself. <clears throat> It's also very multi-domain. Um, EW operates in the land, um, on the sea, in the air, and in space. And space, EW space RF systems are becoming more and more important as we go along. Um, but it's not just 
you know, in the RF spectrum, it, it includes uh, adjacent things like the acoustic signals or um, more and more in the in the cyber community world. Um, and at some point it's going to start pulling in, you know, actually optical communications, which again is light, but it's a, it's a different way of thinking about it. Um, so a lot of people will say, well, warfare means bad, battleships and, and, and war, some war settings. Um, and it's not, it's very much in our day-to-day -day lives. It's part of our civilian uh, environment. The first time we really consistently saw it was in the 9-1, right after 9-11 during the mass call event where everybody was trying to phone loved ones. And uh, essentially there was a denial of service attack on the uh, radio spectrum because now the cell phone signals could get through because there was just too much going on. Um, emergency management, uh, we've got disasters and things that happen. You want to be able to communicate and, and figure out what's going on. A lot of Coast Guard and border security activity that happens in this space, trying to track uh, smugglers and so forth. Uh, we see very active electronic warfare that goes on in the police environment where uh, riders are uh, known to jam police radios, or maybe even your car has a, has a police radar jammer. Uh, probably the play, a spot where there's the most immediate uh, commercial impact is in the aviation control. Right now, um, back in 2018, was the first sort of major drone incident that was reported at uh, Gatwick Airport, where a drone went up and suddenly the airport had to shut down. Now we're at a state where the FAA, just in the U.S. alone, is reporting 100 events uh, uh, every month. Right, and so how do you take the drones down? First of all, how do you confirm that there is in fact a drone? How do you know it's not the local high school drone competition that are, you know, look like they're over the airport, but aren't really? How do you stop them? Um, you know, you don't wanna be shooting at them when there are civilians uh, in the middle of the city. So managing those, those drone events at airports is probably the most immediate, significant civilian setting. Uh, looking at a disaster response scenario, uh, what you, the, the 2010 Haiti earthquake is a really great example because that was an American aircraft carrier that provided the backbone infrastructure to the rescue operations. There were British aircraft, there was international um, aid organizations like the Red Cross and Doctors Without Borders. You had all the local first responders, police, fire, hospitals, ambulance, um, and then thousands of volunteers came in to help distribute food and you know, surgeons would go in, you know, orthopedic surgeons would go in and reconstruct bones. Um, so all of that in the broad concept of trying to locate and rescue the victims, right? So locating a victim, if they're buried under gravel, you can do part of that through um, x-rays and what have you, but you can also use cell phone signals to try and do the locations. Uh, this is a really cool coordinated task planning and how do you cause different systems that weren't designed to work together to actually work together so that you can you can make things happen, given that there's no infrastructure. There was no cellular infrastructure. The airport traffic control tower was down. They, they an aircraft, the Air Force, um, Master Char Sergeant went in and ran uh, air traffic control uh, on the single runway um, at the airport for 10 days from a card table. I mean, it's considered the largest single runway operation in history. 4,000 flights in 10 days from a card table. So this becomes, you know, so starting at, it's this huge network coordination, battle management, right? All the activities that are going on. Why is this electronic warfare and not just a coordination thing? Well, there's these things called nefarious users. Typically in this environment, it's a black marketeer problem where you're, the folks are trying to figure out where the Red Cross shipments are going and you know, take them and sell them on the black market. So not only do you wanna find the black mar marketeers, but you wanna keep them off the network, maybe give them misinformation, maybe arrest them, right? That whole infrastructure, why is this not just a, a friendly let's coordinate and help help the victims. So in EW, we've got a half a dozen concepts that we, we talk about. The first is electronic support, which is uh, understanding the spectrum, who is using it, um, how, when, where. If we go to a sort of cocktail party analogy, we would be talking about who are the various individuals, the, the subgroups that are talking to each other. And then as people move around the room, um, you know, how are those conversations cha uh, changing? Who are the power brokers in the room? Um, you know, did someone leave for a bit and come back? All of those kinds of things. 
electronic protect protects the friendly nodes from undesirable effects. Um, so that would be things like, um, um, you know, if you're an aircraft and there's an incoming missile, you want to confuse the missile so that it doesn't hit you. In the cocktail party, you'd be doing things like this so that you can hear better, right? You want to improve the quality of the signal coming to your, your receiver. Electronic attack denies the adversary access to their own spectrum. So this is the equivalent of me turning on the big loud speakers with, you know, the rock band to shut down everybody's conversations in the room. Um, battle damage assessment. Let's say you take an action like turning on that speaker. Um, how, do you, how well did it succeed in stopping everybody from talking? You, know, you can take actions that may or may not have effect. You may or may not be able to see them. Um, so how can you evaluate the impact of, of the actions you just took? And then the last step is EW reprogramming, which is the idea of changing the system so that it can adapt to novel settings. Traditionally in the EW world, this has all been done by humans. Um, and if you're in a setting where, you know, you see a novel um, condition, it can take anywhere from about 72 hours to six months, possibly longer, to update your system so that it can recognize that novel setting. Um, depending on exactly which organization and how urgent it is, but it's it can be months, if not it, longer than that, to to recognize new emitters. In our you know software defined and AI defined world, you could certainly imagine, you know, some high school kid who wants his drone to have a better waveform, going and hacking the way that software works, and you know it's new in the morning from what it was yesterday. It's a new thing, so. Um, you know, the old ways of doing it where this has to be human controlled is not something that we can really be doing uh, in our future. Electronic warfare operates uh, across a whole variety of time loops. So at the fastest time loop where, you know, this number is 100 milliseconds or faster, but we could easily be talking picoseconds, many, many orders of magnitude faster than 100 milliseconds. Um, and that's the sensor because we're talking about receiving information at the speed of light. Right, so there can be a lot of information. We talk about a petabyte a minute uh, on a reasonable antenna. So that's that's a lot of stuff. Um, the whole electronics warfare suite, which is all of the decision making, the entire package is about a second ish time frame, and all of that is processing limited. You know, how much information can you ingest and and think about? Once we move to um, the whole platform, that's all of the sensors on the platform or multi-platform, you become communication limited because you have to be able to coordinate with the other members of your team. Um, so it's no longer that latency that is uh, sub-second. You've also got the whole, you know, the force level uh, decision-making and, and understanding of what's happening that happens at least tens of seconds, but minutes to hours. You know, so if you're imagining you're the battle commander of that Haiti earthquake setting, you know, you're not thinking about things at the second level, but at the minutes are slower. Sorry. Um, at the operational loop, the way that this ends up looking is uh, seconds are faster. I usually talk about this in milliseconds because that's kind of the, the time frame that we, we tend to operate in most. Um, but you've got that electronic support, understanding what's happening in the environment at, at the time, who's out there, what are they doing? Um, and that list of observations goes into the decision-making module, the protect or the attack decision. So you're choosing your response to the environment to um, figure out what your, maximize your objectives. And then, um, Whatever action you took, you have to figure out whether it worked. So that's your battle damage assessment. So you've got your full, your full cognitive system kind of control loop there, right? So you've got your, your understanding what's happening in the environment, deciding what to do about it, taking the action, and then figuring out whether it worked. <clears throat> um, so modern electronic warfare compared to, you know, electronic warfare has been around for 100 years now. Uh, and um, Modern systems, because we're now software defined and becoming increasingly AI defined, uh, there's a lot of AI, uh, EW problems that I think AI really can tremendously help with. The domain is extremely dynamic. So we are talking about a domain where the observations are fleeting. You know, it might be a single pulse. So a picosecond of information. Yes. So I guess I'd like to um, understand a little bit more. I mean, I understand that it's becoming automated 
computer driven. It's not just the old fashioned sensors and the airwaves kind of mm -hmm. thing, right? And so in my world, which is networking and cybersecurity, I'm not sure that I would necessarily put the name AI on it as I would put, you know, automated sensor driven decision making, which, I mean, we can all mm -hmm. debate what's AI and what's right. not when right. we start talking about those things. Yep. So, you know, I really would look forward to understanding more about especially when you, the learning algorithms yep. and error rates and all of that. Right. So I have a chart towards the end where I talk about the three axes of what I view a cognitive system to be, where it moves from automated, because we can be automated with a strict you know, knee-jerk response, a library lookup, right? So I talk about how you can increase the cognitive uh, capability across each of those axes coming up. Um, Yes, so di uh, very dynamic domain, observations are fleeting, the timeline is extremely fast, and lots of novel conditions, to this extent that we would usually be saying um, that we never see the same thing twice. And there's enough uh, variation and, and chaos almost in the, in the signal. There's physics, but it's so highly complex that uh, pretty much everything we see could be considered novel. Um, you've got the progression of the mission, and I say that in you know, the... the battle terminology, but it's in the sense of who are the nodes that are coming in and out, right? So if you're managing a building, you know, who, who's leaving the building? It's extreme. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about why everything is novel? So in the example that you gave of, you know, the airfield where there may be drones coming mm -hmm. in, it seems pretty... Yeah, it does, except similar. that the way that RF signals propagate, you know, they can get confused by a drop of water in the air. Right. So depending on what your definition is, but of um, novel, right, there's a fairly easy air quotes clustering if none of the mo no nodes are moving and the weather is pretty stable. But as soon as your weather patterns start changing, as soon as your m m nodes start moving, you're now starting to get you know, multipath, right? So I'm talking to, to you, but you are also hearing it as the, it's bouncing off the walls in the room. Um, so all of that comes in and makes it you know, hard. Uh, so extremely resource constrained, time is obviously the biggest one, but to many of these systems are operating on very small devices. Uh, you know, you, you might have like a soldier handheld radio um, that is not as capable as your cell phone, um, but, uh, and, and then the expendables, the things, the, 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 the systems that you have that may not survive, um, whether their batteries die or, or other reasons. Um, it's fascinatingly complex. As I said, it's a very rich RF environment. You've also got a lot of different data sources that you can pull information in, the various sensors that are on the uh, node itself, but also all of the um, correlated things, right? I mean, you could get a satellite feed, even though you're a, you know, a Humvee. Um, platforms are heterogeneous. Uh, typically, because of those swap constraints, if you have two drones, you're going to put different sensors on each of those drones, which means that they're going to be um, capable of different things, and you have to manage that heterogeneity. Uh, you can get a lot of ambiguity in your observations um, for, for any number of reasons, um, but uh, often the, you know, the way that you're observing it, it's not clear. Let's say you have two people that hear the same thing. You know, the way that they receive it and the way that they process that information, it doesn't even look like they're the same necessarily. So you're outlining like a number of problems here, and I'm curious to know which you think, you know, you have this technical problem where, like you mentioned, uh, uh, raindrops, right? That's a that's a technical problem that, may, you know, maybe a certain type of algorithm or a certain tune, type of algorithm that exists tuned a certain way might solve. And if these other problems of, of, of different types of resource constraints, then you have other problems, for example, of, of uh, uh, stakeholder buy-in, you have problems of, of you know, human-computer interaction. Um, which of those do you see stakeholders right yeah there. which of those do you see as, as being sort of driving the car here as being like like the fundamental issue is is it okay we just don't have the technology to do this and we need to develop new algorithms or is it we can do this we just need to make sure that the computers and the humans are on the same on the same wavelength is it that you know we can do this and it, everything works but nobody believes it what so all of the above um okay. uh, all of the above i, I mean that. um well it can't i mean it, if, Which if, is, if the technology exists to do all of this, that's that's a completely different story, right? So I would argue that the technology exists for most things okay. in not necessarily as fieldable solutions. Sure. So, um, you know, whenever 
never probably going to solve the raindrop problem, okay. but we, you know, we can get around it by abstracting and so forth. Um, but uh, the the uh, frequently they're very, very siloed, very early technology, right? Sometimes very small academic studies. Um, and then, you know, the, then you need the funding and the buy-in to take it to the next step. Right, when you think DOD scale though, like if it's just a matter of like compute power, that these problems could be, you could solve the raindrop problem if if phones were supercomputers, right? Well, With okay. the power available. Right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Your rock curve isn't right. going to succeed there because yeah. you can't stick the, so, you know, quantum computing, um, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that might solve some of these problems, but I'm not going to be able to take my soldier radio and bring it down to 0 0.1 degrees Kelvin <laughs> anytime soon. Sure, sure. <laughs> Um, you know, so so what you end up with is this interesting. There are point solutions, but bringing it all together is is a headache. There's a huge trust issue, um, partly because people don't understand it. And so that was one of the goals of this book is to start talking about what, you know, what is AI, and um, uh, you know, it can help you solve the problems. It might not solve all of it, but it might get you halfway there. So as a, in the example of the two receivers listening to the same emitter, they may end up recording slightly different things because of the fact that they're seeing it from a different angle and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, the ability for an AI to cluster that and say, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're the same or I'm pretty sure they're not, you know, those, that's your first 80%. And then, it, you know, maybe you move the human into the borderlines between whether it is, in, is or is not the same thing, All right? So that's where the human machine teaming starts coming in, okay? So yes, complex and distributed. One question is, um, do these systems malfunction or they have bugs or something? No, it all works on perfectly. So <laughs> that, 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 but can you distinguish those cases from real attacks or external? Uh, um, I would argue that um, well-experienced people sitting in, in, the, in the hot seat probably can. Um, but it's still a, it's in a lot of ways, it's just enough years of experience. Yeah, that's the cable that isn't plugged in properly. Um, and I would, I have not yet seen an example of, um, you know, the AI that says, oh, gee, you forgot to turn it on in a, in a useful, in a way that, you know, that human can, can immediately respond to it. So, yeah. All right. So yes, multiple stakeholders, heterogeneity. So bringing this into you know, the problem statement, uh, the traditional approaches to EW are failing for a variety of reasons. We, the timeline is too fast. Humans think it's seconds or slower. Um, we're talking about systems that are seconds or faster. Complexity is too high. Humans are pretty good at two, maybe three trade-offs that we can balance fairly easily, naturally. With training, we can get up to five or six. And we may be talking on a single platform of a thousand different things that we're trying to trade off. And as soon as you go heterogeneous and distributed, and that can become infinite pretty quickly. Um, and traditionally from a uh, EW perspective, and that includes radar for sure, and maybe less so in the radio, but certainly I know the flavor is there in the radio world, that uh, the, the idea of being able to handle a completely novel, um, a novel thing uh, really doesn't exist. And that was always done by the humans coming back and, and adding a new capability to it. So the problem statement is that we want to be able to automatically learn which actions are the most effective to meet our performance objectives given novel RF conditions. So we're trying to characterize the environment, and that's situation assessment. We're trying to choose the best strategy that improves our overall mission objectives, that's your decision making, and then learn the performance of the available strategies for those novel settings. Okay. Can you give us a sense of the actions that Sure. Um, so uh, let's say um, a not. Uh, let's say there's a, a loud jammer that's operating the single frequency that you've been trying to communicate. You can use a notch filter to subtract that out of the signal, and so that you can still hear your friend. Um, in a communications network, you could choose, there's a big granite rock that is causing it, you know, between us and you can't hear me because the big granite rock between us, I can, you know, go tell Jim and he can tell you, right? The multi-hop multi routing. Um, I can, uh, instead of using an omnidirectional antenna, I can use a directional antenna, okay? 
Um, and depending on your system, it's fairly easy to think though that there would be something on the order of about a thousand different things that you can control on any given platform. <laughs> So the mapping of concepts between AI and electronic warfare is actually not bad. It's, it's a fairly close mapping. So we would say situation assessment. The EW community would say electronic support. There's also a concept of ELINT, the um, electronic intelligence, which is, tends to come more from the radar community. Decision making we uh, appears in the EW world as electronic protect or attack. That's the, the decisions you can make to make things better for yourself or to hurt, you know, make it difficult on the other side. Um, and the slower time battle management. So that's the, the coordination across all of the, the individuals and organizations in, in the uh, environment. We talk about execution monitoring, which comes from the EW world as a battle damage assessment. That's, you know, did I successfully keep that black marketeer off the network? Um, or effects analysis, did I successfully route my signal around the granite rock? Um, and then we would say learning where the uh, EW world would talk about uh, EW reprogramming um, to the extent that that's changing the data or the software on the system. But EW reprogramming happens in the days to months uh, timeframe rather than in anything faster than that. Um, so here I'm, I'm what I'm, I'm giving you here is the kind of the boxology of an EW system with some of the sprinkling of AI on top. So you have the pre-mission activity that happens in the days to months ahead and traditional you know, AI mission planning type activity works would work extremely well here. Um, battle management and network management, that's the things that happen in the minutes uh, to hours time frame. Um, that's taking care of uh, situations, tasks that change, goals that change as, as your day progresses, and making sure that the humans in the loop are aware of what's happening and why. The next two boxes, support and the electronic uh, support and the protected attack, that is happening sub second. Um, there's a variety of different situation assessment techniques that I think have, would have immediate impact on that on the EW community if, if they had better tools available to them. Uh, the characterization, the behaviors of what we're seeing, patterns of life, that kind of thing, classification. Um, data fusion is something that uh, really hasn't penetrated the EW community at all, which uh, you know I think that's kind of crazy because I think data fusion is perhaps one of the biggest wins that, that could happen. Uh, anomaly detection, that is still not uh, really raised as a, as a concept in this space. Uh, causal relationships, you know, who's talking to whom? Again, this would be a low-hanging fruit that I think we could really, uh, you know, just even a small capability here would change uh, an EW mission uh, quite dramatically. Uh, you know, you think about those black marketeers. Can you figure out who are they talking to? Who's in that team? And then intent recognition, what's going to happen? Cartoon here is the idea of an air traffic control network versus a radar that's on a SAM missile battery. Um, you know, in theory, they're both tracking airplanes. One of them is trying to help you land. The other one is trying to not help you land. Um, and so, so can you tell the difference between the behaviors of those two radar systems that are tracking the aircraft? Um, on the decision-making side, you've got the various strategy optimizations. What are the best decisions to make given the changing uh, RF conditions, um, scheduling, we've got a you know, rapid uh, scheduling problem of when to receive, when to transmit. And if you are a platform that can do both, you know, what can happen is that I, I try to jam you, but it turns out I jam everybody else instead, or as well, and that's not a good thing either. Um, I think anytime decision-making uh, is something that, that could be really powerful here because you've got examples where you need to respond really quickly. There are examples where you can take a little longer to think about it. Um, the coordination capability, I think, is perhaps a, a really interesting research area for us as an AI community because you're negotiating the communications. It's not just, you know, the AI assumption of all communications are infinite, perfect, reliable, all the other positives, but actually, you know, you're negotiating how you communicate. Um, data management, uh, one of the most impressive things, if you will, about the EW community is they are collecting a petabyte a minute on some of these platforms. And nobody ever looks at it because they don't even know what to look for in that data. You know, it's not being, it typically not being well tagged with metadata and you know, all the cool events, even you know, uh, uh, the, the, the concepts of, okay, and the airplane has now landed. So therefore we can 
you know, turn it off the radar and say, yes, it's still being recorded, but we don't need to. Even that's not, not typically in your system. So lots of opportunities. Now, for kind of for anybody, anybody in the AI community could probably find a funny W problem to work on. Um, so next couple of slides, I'm only going to give you three or four, but typically when I'm giving a, a day-long lecture uh, to the EW community, I will have a whole bunch of these slides. And the sense of what I'm going to give you here is a sense of the type of depth that I give when I'm talking to the AI, the EW community. Okay. Um, can I ask a question about your last slide, though? So you said no one ever, you, they collect a petabyte of data and no one ever looks at it and they don't use it. Why do they collect it? Because we might need it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. After action report. In theory, at a petabyte of data, how many needles are you going to find in that haystack? I mean, we're really good at finding the known nouns, right? So we know that there's whatever, a television station. Let's record it. Okay. Well, great. What about the guy who was hiding underneath the television station or, you know, the, the high school kid who hacked that waveform? Now, we may not record it or, you know, look at it. We only look for the things we know. It, not that this is an observer bias or anything in the way we manage our data. But, yeah, we are very good at collecting data that no one ever looks at. Okay. And since we're here, one question is that where would you place adversarial reasoning and understanding that it's just a, an innocent drone that is like shouldn't be there a lot of that is going to be here right intent recognition the difference between a really big television that was misconfigured and you know someone a really big jammer that's trying to make a mess of your life um you know and this is exactly the same in the intent recognition for the drone right because what you're trying to do is understand the impact right it's there it's a problem but you know, if it's the local high school drone competition, you're gonna respond very differently than if it's a guy trying to blow up the landing plane. Those are very different responses that you're gonna take. Do you ever, like, is there a consideration of when the response is gonna cause more harm than not? So that would be in here, right? Very much part of your strategy optimization, your multi-objective, you're also looking at risk. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, very much so. Um, and that, you know, that's all stakeholder objectives. And so one of the things I spend a lot of time talking about, a lot of time is the whole assurance problem because we, as human beings, we're very bad in general at writing requirements down. Um, so simple example, the requirement is, air, I'm an airplane, it is, I, uh, make sure that missile doesn't hit me. Okay, so the airplane decides to slam into the sea. It succeeded in its mission, the missile didn't hit it, so we as humans need to get better at writing requirements about what the unacceptable behaviors are, right? AI is good at finding loopholes. I mean, so are your teenagers, so are your toddlers. You know, we're really good at finding loopholes, so is AI. Um, so, you know, make sure that you're bounding what those unacceptable behaviors are more than trying to define what is good. But you're, you're basically saying those unacceptable losses, um, it would be human defined, right? You're not trying to get an AI to, to define it. Well, how many, how many lives are you willing to experiment with before you just realize that that's not okay? Well, I think that's the question. Like if you have a plane mm -hmm. and it's over a city, you don't want to crush the plane either. That's... Right, exactly, exactly. Or a Chinese drone. <laughs> or a balloon, balloons, oh, those are bad. Balloons, <laughs> but like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I hate to say it, but at some point if it's a US plane over a US city versus a Foreign plane over our US city, things might change a little bit in terms of. And that's your risk management framework. So yeah, we talk, I talk a lot about assurance and understanding what the unacceptable behaviors are. And if people say, well, why can't we just test it? It's like, okay, you tell me how many pilots you're willing to sacrifice as we test that concept. And they go, oh, well, yeah, maybe we should write that down first. That would be a good idea. <laughs> um, okay. So I literally start typically with what is AI? Um, and it's not just machine learning, you know, because of course, deep nets, that's all there is to machine learning, right? Well, turns out maybe not. Let's talk about where it came from and all the various sub portions. And so I, depending on how long my talk is, I could spend up to 20 minutes talking about this slide. Um, 
And then the cognitive system. Out, I think outside of the cognitive psychology and the, and the AI communities, I don't know that this is a well understood concept. The fact that you've got an iterative, interactive, deliberative system that reasons about its environment, it chooses actions, it interacts, and then it learns from those experiences. That doesn't seem to be a common. So every time I give this talk, there will be some, a few people in the room that are completely not EW, completely not AI. And they will go, oh, that's a really good idea. You know, and it's like, okay. You know, so it's not, it doesn't seem to be widely understood outside of our communities. Um, so then I map this to the AI boxologies of your situation assessment and your decision making um, and, and point out that in any cognitive system, you're going to have something that looks like this. You might have slightly different names, but it's going to have those capabilities in general, that you're collecting your data, you're trying to figure out if the sensors are good, trying to figure out the long-term impact. You may or may not interact with a human, and then you do this decision making to choose your response. So that is your cognitive system iterative loop, but it is your data and your domain that makes it, in this case, a cognitive EW system. Okay? And it could be just as much, it just equivalently, a cognitive, whatever, surgical system or, or whatever, just depending on what the data is that's, that's going on in that environment. Um, so of the boxes that I had in that functional boxology a minute ago, this is the kind of depth I go into when I'm talking about data fusion. And this is the slide that I would typically give on data fusion, that what we want to be able to do is fuse data across platforms in the case of a sensor, you know, doing triangulation on a sensor, or multi-source, multi, multiple sources. So in this case, we've got the radio, the radar, and the um, EOIR, electro-optical infrared sensor, to try and see the aircraft. Okay, and that improves the, your detection, your um, reliability, and your, your quality of your inferences downstream. Um, and, you know, I give examples to point out that there can be a lot of very low probability events that if you put them all at the same time, suddenly becomes a high probability event of something happening. Okay, but this is the depth that I go to. I don't go deeper than this, but I'll have 15 slides at this kind of level. Um, and people will walk out of it going, wow, that was a real fire hose of information I've never had before. So the point of the book was to give people keywords so that they can go and, you know, this is a problem I want to solve, so I'll go find the keywords of who I should be talking to on this topic. So you have data authenticity, um, you know, as a computer scientist, you know, I would be more concerned about things like, you know, actual data integrity, mm -hmm. chain of command, uh -huh. providence. Yep. Uh, those words seem a little weak to me. That right. So I have a, a, in the, in the data management, I talk about the provenance and the credibility, which is all part of it. So this would end up talking to um, these are the, the kinds of the output of this would help contribute to the credibility of your sources. If you have five sources and one of them is completely inconsistent with the others, then it starts losing credibility. Okay, so I kind of do this for each of the boxes, those white boxes that was in the um, initial pass. Uh, and then I kind of wrap up after I've gone through all those 15 or so slides at approximately that level of depth. I point out that, you know, the reasons you want to know more about AI is because AI can understand patterns that humans can't see. It can make decisions faster than humans and for more complex settings. Um, I have audiences in which software, the whole idea of software is something that's novel to them. Right? The idea that you can have overnight updates, changes to your software, never mind the fact that you could do learning in seconds or faster. Um, and uh, uh, you know, you, we need to be making decisions in seconds or faster in this domain. And so an awful lot of this community is, is very much in that kind of space where they're talking about the hunt. You know, I need a better antenna. That'll give me a better result. You know, uh, about 15 years ago, the thing that started sliding me down the slippery slope of RF systems was I was working on Shuttle Columbia and uh, after the explosion. And the NASA wanted to add more seismic sensors to the wings leading edge panels, the and um, we did some quick math on how much those, how much data those those um, 500 kilohertz sensors would be trying to pump into the black box from the sensors. And we worked out approximately 10 days, the initial 10 minutes of launch data would take three and a half days to get back to the black box on the, on the aircraft. 
and never mind actually coming back and seeing a human being's eyes, right? Um, so I, I turned around and I said, well, give me some of that data. Let's see what we've got in the data that was actually recorded on that launch. And so they gave me the data, both wings and the um, core of the system um, and worked with a flight controller and a couple of other data science types. And we came up with a solution that basically said that, that the flight controller should have known approximately seven seconds after the hole in the wing. Um, because the data made it very clear that the wing was not functional. The um, it, problem was that there was no way of getting, no human was looking at that data, right? It was going into the black box and it was never being seen by a data. But NASA's response was, we need more sensors. Not, we need better data ana analytics and better human, human factors to present that information to that flight controller. And if you're a flight controller and your hand is on a $100 million red button, you need some pretty convincing data to, to before you're going to hit that button and ditch the launch. And that was not what NASA was looking at. And that, I think, is, is per pervasive across this community, is that more sensors will solve the problem, right? Like, okay, well, maybe we need bit more, more and better um, data processing behind it. All right, so now kind of shifting into the how the AI community can help. I've kind of alluded to most of these already, but the reason that I got into RF as opposed to robotics is that I thought robotics was too simple. You know, turn right now, go five meters. Okay, well, let's talk about RF. Um, so I've, I think I've talked about all of these pieces, but you know, a thousand parameters, massive optimization problem, petabytes of data every minute. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, I think the big, the kicker, the um, big issue is that you're actually negotiating how you communicate. It's not like you can just do distributed actions. You're 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 coordinating how you coordinate, um, and that's that adds an extra layer of complexity. Breaks many of the assumptions of AI systems. So here is my 3D graph, and I my. You know, the, the punchline, the bluff is the, is the title. You know, so if talking to the RF community, these are the kinds of things that I would, you know, ask that, that uh, people think about when they're talking to the, AI, uh, the RF community. And the first is that a lot of these people think that AI is a one-size-fits-all solution. And that's probably true across domains outside of AI, right? You know, AI will solve everything, feed the world hungry, fix climate change. Um, but, you know... AI isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. So you have to figure out where you are now on this chart and figure out where you need to be for uh, your, you know, the activities you're trying to accomplish. So, so we've got the situation assessment and you've got a data lookup. Um, uh, moving up through those boxes that I had and you want your, your characterization and classification data usually long-term intent inference. Um, your decision-making from a library lookup what is the response I should do now through things that are actually multi-objective, ad adaptive to changing conditions? And maybe you want to be fully mission aware. Who else is in your team? What are the um, resource consumption, time, all of those things over time, right? The what if scenarios as you go out. From the machine learning perspective, how much is known already versus how much is unknown? If you are working with just something that lives within the confines of physics, like, I don't know, the, the kinematics of an aircraft carrier, that's really not gonna change at millisecond timeframes, um, but you know, RF could. So understanding how quickly that's going to change drives how much you should be really seriously thinking about a machine learning solution. So traditionally W systems operate in this bottom left corner where we look up who are the emitters that are out there. And these are the ones that we know, obviously, because we're looking it up in the library. We choose a response and we don't learn anything new. So what, which of these three axes matter more? Do you, are you care more about new emitters, surprises, brand new um, systems that are on the field? Do you care more about handling multiple objectives for multiple stakeholders? Do you care more about you know, a better quality description of the data? You know, so in my NASA flight controller thing, that would have been all situation assessment and the human factors of describing that information to the human because it's still going to be the human who finally decides to hit the red button. Um, right, so figure out where you are in your current world, and you can, you know, take the baby steps to where you want to be uh, at the end of your time frame. Um, 
Classification, this is something that finally, I would say, in the last five years or so, has really taken off in the RF world. And I think there's still a hell of a lot we can offer. Um, but being able to classify different objects, that, objects that are definitely different, but have a distinct similarity between them, um, you know, in the, in the multiple types of boats or, uh, you know, other platforms, the kinds of cars that are out there, that's well within the scope of what we can do. C different sea state is the biggest thing that will change your ship identification goes on across um, all of the, the, the sensor modalities and things that you're trying to classify. And this is what would either RF fingerprinting or specific emitter, depending on which community, RF community you're talking about. But this was different tail members from aircraft using only their radio signal, the quality of their radio signal to classify them. All right, so I was doing RF fingerprinting based on the qualities of that, the, the IQ signals. Um, and then uh, to do that, that classification of those signals. Um, and if you are talking, you know, Internet of Things, you may be talking in a single house, a thousand devices that you're trying to distinguish between and keep track of. Um, a lot of because this is just definitely a, an environment where the humans are very closely involved in the in the current decision making loop. Um, I think that we've got a lot to offer on the cognitive assistance side, and this would also do a lot to build trust. Um, so helping build models, can we, as I said, detect the this is definitely different, def probably the same, and then what is the borderline? So helping uh, classify the similar emitters. You know, being able to merge different perspectives of the same emitter and detect the anomalies. Um, data fusion, data fusion, data fusion, data fusion. I think there's so much we could do here, both multi-platform and multi-sensor. Um, a variety of things under the action selection that loosely falls into the category of multi-objective optimization. Um, but uh, understanding uh, what are the trade-offs, you know, the risk profiles, the costs, the benefits, all of that that comes into space when you're making those decisions. And sometimes it may only be choosing between three or four different options, but um, understanding how that impacts all of the various objectives that you're working with. Uh, there's also a variety of organizational support things that, that sort of don't fall to the direct EW community, but to the ecosystem in which they live. And that's, uh, you know, trying to help whether it's a new engineer who's trying to attach a cable to the back of a box um, or uh, you know, the manager that's trying to retain their employees, all of those same kinds of things that happen in, in large businesses, there's some obvious low hanging, not low hanging fruit, but obvious needs um, in, in, in this community as well. Um, it, the uh, RF community in general is an aging population. I am still frequently the youngest um, in the room. And it's finally beginning to change. Well, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. <laughs> um, but uh, definitely, you know, it's an aging population. So um, one of the biggest things I see, the AI community, I feel like has gotten into a bit of a rut of expecting billions of well-labeled advice, uh, uh, well-labeled examples. This is changing, but it is definitely a flavor of the community. We are operating in an, op in an environment where uh, we have to be able to respond to a single example. So you're, we are certainly seeing, you know, zero shot learning and low shot learning and transfer learning and these kinds of things happening. But, you know, what happens if it's not a deep net? That, and, and what happens? How quickly can you be reliable even with a deep net uh, kind of approach? Because deep nets aren't necessarily appropriate in embedded systems yet. And so that would be another research area, right? Getting deep nets to where it can run on a small FPGA reliably. And it's happening. Um, so I've got a variety of tests constructs here too that that really um, lend support to the to the the broad goal of being able to do in mission learning um, so multi you know, multi fidelity multi resolution testing right we don't do that very well we either have low fidelity modeling and sim or we do, you know do a live field test um, and there's very strict brick walls between them. What we really want in a very long-term perspective is something that is better than physics level simulation at faster than real time. Um, you know, right now trying to, to simulate physics um, is not something that happens anywhere near real time, never mind faster than real time. Uh, I will often talk about the infinity cubed scenarios 
where uh, we 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 are really operating in a, in, a, in an environment where blue can have a fit, an infinite number of things it can do. Right? When you've got a thousand settings per node and you've got multiple nodes, same for the other side, the adversary. Now you throw in the environment and the fact that the sea can be doing whatever it wants and you have very little control over the mood of the ocean. Um, you know, you could easily be in a in a environment where we're, where we're infinity, we've got infinity cube scenarios to test. So how do we do that? Um, and being smart about what we what experiments we choose to do at the increasing levels of fidelity. And then as we have experience at the higher level, pushing that information back down to improve the quality as you go back down. A um, couple examples here, uh, threat tracker. So you've got a, a whole bunch of incoming somethings and you, you know there's a fleet of drones coming at you at that airport. Um, and it's one airport that, that is being tested, the system under test. Um, you know, you might have some of the AI you might have inside that would be information uncertainty because you've got partially observable information. AI can really, could potentially really help with that um, information uncertainty. Hysteresis, going back in time. I know I saw it at time X. Well, when did I see it really before that? And can that help uh, the data fusion? Not that I'm harping on that topic. Um, and we've got a, you know, some of the metrics that we might want to measure here. It's not just accuracy, but we're also looking at detection time, both how wall clock time and also how many detections do you need before you're reasonably accurate against any number of different ways that your scenario can be complex. Um, so to the extent this is strictly understanding what's happening, we can probably get away with just open loop data replay. Right? You know, you go down to the airport and you record for a few hours. You know, you might be able to get, get away with the data replay. But for the most part, we're going to need a closed loop system because as soon as you can even change the frequency you're listening to, suddenly your data replay isn't going to work well. Um, so you need that to be a closed loop setting. Novel emitters is perhaps the number one use case that people will bring up. You know, boy, there was a surprise and that was a bad thing. Um, so not only do you under, need to understand what the surprise was actually doing, but how do we respond to it? So you might have AI capabilities that include the, the electronic support of the anomaly detection, the intent recognition, but then also the decision optimization and the reinforcement learning that would come with that. So what are we doing? We're analyzing the quality of the characterization, analyzing the quality of the response. Um, how well did we evaluate our effects, right? So sometimes it's easy to evaluate whether my, it's easy for me to evaluate whether my action worked, sometimes it's not. And so being able to, as the test system, figure out how good the system was when it, uh, as the, the to, 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 to make that computation. And again, the learning rate is a big one. Against, again, how complex is your scenario and, and measure complexity in a variety of different ways. I've got a long list of examples here of the different kinds of ways, that, the different components of what a complete test might look like. Um, Ablation trials is a sort of more comprehensive um, out domain, um, outside of the domain of expertise testing out of sample, because as soon as you go completely novel, you know, you've tested on all the mammals and suddenly you've got now an amphibian. Okay, so that's what your ablation trial is going to do. How well can you go completely outside of your original domain of expertise? Um, so long term, you know, I'd love to see a, you know, a challenge problem here. Attritable unmanned fleets. We're seeing this. You know, there are people doing sw swarming work, um, but it's contested out airspace, multi-domain, uh, and we, you know, this the examples here on the right. You know, the, there was a ship called the Dewey that uh, there were 96 Chinese drones that came in and made a god awful mess of that destroyer. And they were literally scared of their, for their lives, you know, direct immediate threat to the safety of the ship and the crew. Okay, that's a bad thing. And airports would say the same thing. You know, more of these drone things that are seen in the airports, maybe we'll, you know, can, how pleased would people be if LAX shut down for 24 hours? Happened in Dublin about a month ago. Not many people happy. Right. Um, and uh, so this RAND report actually talks about what we're going to do in the Chinese case for the uh, Dewey type situation. They've actually lay out the whole, this is how many um, systems we would need if we were doing that in that environment. Um, we are, as a community, too quick to talk about optimality. 
BW changes too fast. Uh, so we really can't be talking about um, optimality anymore. It is also hard to measure, right? And, and, and you know, when you're talking about something that's changing at nanoseconds or picoseconds, what is optimality? Um, uh, so part of that is there's a pragmatics that the systems are often over-engineered or engineered to handle the most pressing threats. Um, and so you really do have a Pareto optimal curve. Uh, so we should be talking about good enough. What is good enough? Satisficing, going back to the what, 1960s of satisficing? Um, we've got a number of AI evaluation approaches that actually bug me. Everybody talks about the F1 score. It's like, that's not useful. It's not relevant to my mission. So an F1 score in this radar example would only talk about the green diamonds that say I've accurately recognized mode one of radar one. And we don't talk about, well, you got the correct mode, the wrong radar, but the correct mode. So this might be search, track, acquire as the different modes. You know, so we need to have a much better approach to computing you know, partial credit uh, confusion matrices. Um, when we talk about root mean squared error, we only talk about this piece, the root mean squared error. Well, if you've got multiple objectives sitting around, you know, one of them is measured from zero to a billion, and the next one's measured from zero to one, well, what does root mean squared error mean? You know, and how do you balance those? So normalizing it against the, you know, against the standard deviation will actually give you something where you can compare apples to apples on those models. Um, we also have, a, have settings in which the utility function, the, the metrics change over time. So saying that it is accurate for the mission, it's like, well, no, it was accurate at this time on the mission. All right, and then wrapping up here, that I think there's a lot the AI community can offer the EW community. Uh, and, uh, you know, looking at some of those, those low hanging fruit, I think would build a whole lot of trust. Um, and um, we should get more serious about making those interactions happen. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a question or two. And I'm looking at the questions online. Uh, please post questions in the QA box if you are curious about any of these topics. So what have you been doing with respect? I mean, this is very nice. You've been talking about this, but in terms of specific technologies and stuff or particular parts of the problem, because it seems like a very large problem. Yeah, it's a huge problem space. Um, so I do a variety of different things. Um, I have built a system that flies. Um, and that got focused on the decision making. So I did the machine learning, the reinforcement learning, and the decision making um, for the communications networks. Um, so maintaining the communications even when it's difficult. So that's that's probably where I sp have spent the most amount of my time. Mm -hmm. um, but for the last five years or so, it's been more um, sort of directing research groups and looking at how and looking at the systems they have and helping them identify where their brittle components are and helping them figure out where their, which AI components they should be looking into more. Um, roughly half my time right now is helping um, figure out how to test cognitive EW systems because it's a, you know, you, you could imagine any one of these boxes in a system, how the heck do you test it so that the end user will believe it. So uh, most of my time in the last year has been learning more about AI assurance approaches. Mm -hmm. And a related question is if there are uh, simulators that would let you test uh, these kinds of capabilities or if there's data sets that might be useful for people to, to see what the data is. There's a lot like. of data sets that can help in that characterization piece, assuming that the thing you're trying to characterize isn't changing behavior. Right. Um, so there's, and that you can go to Google. There's, there's some nice data sets out there that will do that. Um, from the, the biggest open gap really is the closed loop setting because um, we don't uh, tend to do very well um, at modeling kind of those adversarial settings, right? Um, when you think about playing chess, you know, yes, it's an adversarial setting, but it's a closed 
environment of actions that can be taken. And so you can imagine many, many millions of simulations that will do that. Now you start laying in the cognitive layer of what that chess player might be doing. Do we do that well as a simulation? Jim, let me, you know, do we simulate those, the brains behind the, the chess games well? So, for, for what from the chess? chess was my example. No. no. Okay. So there you go. Now you've got, you know, <laughs> so, you know, so we, we, these are complex systems and we do, are definitely, certainly in EW, we never would have the, the, the human user part of it as the simulation. The only time the humans would come in is up here. So I was wondering, one thing I'm not sure I caught was talking about how you present the information, because you said several times there's no human looking at it, mm -hmm. but also when this is moving so fast and everything. They and, literally have a spectrogram. Yeah, right. So That's how do it. we get past that, right? We need to be able to present data yes. real time, rapidly, yep. and in a way that's digestible by the human. I mean, yep. you know, my father was an air traffic controller oh. in the Korean War, and he loves talking about that. Yeah. But... And the GUIs haven't changed much since that was working. Right. Uh huh. <laughs> no, and, and in fact, he listens. You can listen to yeah, yeah. live air traffic control yeah. at LAX, and he sure. sits there in his armchair and listens to yeah. that. Right. It's the same input output function for the human, and, yeah. and we need to move past that. Yeah, we absolutely do. So yeah, that is. I have a a, a whole section that I will get into the human factors of it, because and that's also I think one of the ways that we can go about doing some of the learning from one example, right? Because these these users, the humans, understand our signal processing. That's been around for a hundred years. They get it. If you say that this is a mode cycling jammer, they know what that means right? It, gut feeling, they know exactly what that means. So if you can present a piece of information that says, I chose to do this because it was a mode cycling jammer, they go, the human goes, oh, got it, understood, right? So if you, in, I, in one of my cartoons actually might be- But your space shuttle example. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, I mean, I do know how I would present it. I don't know if I'd present it well enough that they would trust me, right. but I do know how, okay, I don't have that cartoon in here, but the idea of, let's say you have your deep net that's learning all of your latent features of the RS space, but then adjacent to that, you have the hand computer features. Um, of, of those RF signals. And I think then what ends up happening, you know, what ends up happening is that the deep that learns kind of the difference between what the RF signal processing engineers have built and the reality, right? Instead of a sine wave, it's a, a little bit squared off as there's, you know, those kinds of things. And um, so you can still base your explanation back to the user on the features that they understand. And I think it would get us to where we would be learning from a single example more efficiently and effectively. So I will say one other thing, and I'll let you guys go on the representation. So we see in cyber and network operations, right? We have a whole new generation coming up that are the ones that have played, you know, mm -hmm. virtual reality games their whole life. And so they are ready to see things in a different way. They are. They are. All right. We're going to end here and thank Karen for um, everything we've learned today about cognitive electronic warfare. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.